Hello, Salt Strong Nation. Joe Simon. It's like Diamond's back again. Got my boy just on. What's up, Joe? Yo. What's up, man? Dude, how do we make sense of this whole thing? We have all these different changes. It turns out, if you're listening, we're watching, or um, regardless of how you're doing, we're going to go through this 20 pages. You need an attorney to read through all this stuff. And I'm kidding. FWC actually did a pretty good job of just kind of summarizing and putting bullet points. But still, it is confusing when you're going out there just trying to catch a redfish and can't decide if you're supposed to keep or not because you can't understand what's going on. A lot of different changes being proposed. Not all of these have gone into effect yet. So we want to go like right off the bat say that what we're going to talk about here has not officially happened yet and i think that's what's caused a lot of confusion because we we saw the whole thing about catch and release only in indian river and uh, you know people all of a sudden said oh my gosh I, I can't believe we can't keep them that has not happened yet uh it might it might happen very soon but it has not happened yet and there's some there's some great stuff in here there's also some stuff that some of you might not like as much uh, but in general, I, I think the part about taking it from three zones to what nine is a good thing, right? Uh, I mean, because sometimes you see this massive area, right? And not just like a couple cities, but many, many counties. And some people up here catching trout left and right. And some people down here can't get a trout to save their lives. And yet they're all lumped into one big thing. So I think that's a, a great, uh, a great, uh, a hopefully addition if this all goes through. So Justin, I've got up on screen. I'm going to let you do a lot of the talking here. And uh, we'll just go right here to slide number one out of 20. So kind of the spark note version before we dive into this is like Luke's or like Joe said, FWC, instead of considering, at least for the state of Florida, all of the Gulf and all the Atlantic or before there were there were three sections, Northwest, Southwest, and then a chunk of the Atlantic. Look at them right there. Yep, you can kind of see it right there. The current state regulations are kind of broken up into three sections here throughout Florida for uh, harvest regulations for redfish in particular. There's harvest regulations for all the other species, but in this you know little uh, layout from FWC, it's looking at redfish in particular. And you can kind of see what the current state regulations are. We've got you know 18 to 27 inches is, is the slot limit that we all know, eight fish limit uh, per vessel, and six fish per person for transport for per person move. And, you know, the Northeast region, you get two redfish for Northwest and the South region, which is Central East Coast, all the way down to the Everglades and up to about that Tampa Bay area, it kind of cuts off right at like Spring Hill, Hudson. Um, it's one red per person. And, uh, and then same for the Northwest. But the, the cool thing about this, guys, is what you need to realize is that FWC, a lot of these decisions and these conversations of how we're going to regulate um, redfish harvest and the stock of, of like what we can keep, what we're able to possess in a day has a lot to do with attending and speaking out at these meetings that FWC holds in different regions throughout the year. And I think now every year, every passing year, people are seeing this out of the corner of their eye and they're knowing that FWC is having these conversations, these meetings to hear the public speak out to what their experiences are, what they're seeing, what they're catching in their local waters. And as we kind of scroll further down on this, you'll see that the, the proposed mindset is that we're instead of looking at the state in three sections, okay, we'll come back to this here in a second, instead of looking at the state in three sections, we're going to start looking at it in a bigger view. So what you see here on the map is there's nine different regions that FWC is proposing to separate Florida into. And I think that's great because what it's doing is instead of saying, all right, the Panhandle and Crystal River have the same redfish stock, same amount of people catch about the same amount of fish. They've just kind of lumped that whole section together for a long time. And now they're looking at it and saying, you know, Pensacola redfish and redfish in, you know, Ozello is the population's not really the same you know i mean yes fish move around and there's a good chance that breeder fish could you know come up in both locations but day in day out fishing they're different stocks and they're, they're different little sub communities of fish so fwc is going to propose that we have management in nine different regions to get a better picture or a better view of what these stocks look like in each region and I think that's great. Um, a lot of that of what we're going to find out as we scroll through is 
the feedback from each of these regions of what, what local anglers are saying. How is their fishery doing? Are they finding a lot of redfish? Are they catching more or less? What's attributed to that? Seagrass presence or absence, more bait fish, less bait fish. I mean, all these conversations are being had by the public. And the more you attend and speak out at these events, the more information they're going to have to better determine what the fishery is like in your backyard. So I, I love that they're doing this. I love that they're, they're taking it further to say, you know, th there's a lot more areas to take into consideration than just lumping it into three groups. Yep. And so we're going to break down all nine of these on what they're proposing to do here. The other thing I thought was interesting was this captain crew bag limit. So I, it says strong stakeholder support. And what that tells me is currently, if Justin and I go out with a captain, let's just say for redfish, and let's just say in our area, let's just say we're in the Northeast, uh, we're able to keep two each, right? So it's two for me, two for Justin. And then we could also get two for the captain, even though he might not have caught them per se, we could literally go in with six total redfish, I believe is how I understand it. And a lot of these captains, and especially in the lagoon and even in Tampa Bay, after that really nasty, you know, red tide that we experienced, a lot of the captains came together and says, guys, like, just to make sure we have jobs here for the sustainability of these fisheries, let's agree, like to tell people right up front, we're going to release everything and explain to them why, right? So to turn the charter into, you know, sport fishing, not just, you know, uh, bringing home as much meat as you can, and also to be able to talk about conservation on the, on the charter, about what's happening and, and why the seagrass is not here anymore and it used to be here a year ago. Uh, and, and so that was cool. And so what I'm guessing is a lot of more captains probably are attending these meetings than just the normal average Joe recreational angler and they're going in there saying guys like fwc meaning guys take away this you know this kind of perk if you will because it used to be a perk back in the day you know it was you know it was a big deal right people would come from all over and it's kind of about how many fish you bring back to the back to the cleaning table and and, and then hopefully you know back into your uh, cooler and i think there's definitely been a, a mindset shift and so it sounds like uh, most of the captains that are going to these events, which as Justin said, that is where they're getting a lot of the feedback to make these decisions are uh, saying, Hey, let's get rid of, uh, of, of the ability for us to be able to keep, uh, keep fish. So we will scroll down here. This is an annual root review example. Oh man. It's bringing are you there? memories. Yeah. Can you hear me? I think you uh, might be cutting. Oh no. Did it freeze? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Woo! We're back. Woo, back. man. Yes, the internet connection unstable. Uh, unbelievable. Come it's all good. So podcast and I, I wanted to say, do you remember Walker's K Chronicles? Oh, yeah. Flip palette. So over the, what is it? I'm thinking that was like 80s, right? Maybe kind of trickled into the early 90s too. That show, and I think you'd, you would agree with this, that over the past 30 years, the view of redfish as a sport fish has changed substantially. There are still people that love to go out and, and harvest redfish. And I think that's great. I think everybody should have the, the choice and the ability to go out and harvest if they, so if they want to. But I would say that, you know, we, we kind of talked off record about Mosquito Lagoon and Indian River, for example, areas to be just catch and release. I would say that a good majority of guides, maybe not all, are in support of this for the future of that fishery in their backyard. There's a lot of changes happening. There is a significant loss of seagrass and the regrowth has not been rapid. Uh, it's very, very slow. And I think that, you know, for the betterment of the fishery and for the future of a lot of these captains and their business, catch and release would, would be in their favor. You know, I mean, that's uh, giving people the opportunity to catch quality redfish year after year comes with us not pulling from that stock. Yep. And then, in the bass world, I mean, they they went through this. And a gentleman by the name of Ray Scott, who started Bass, which is, you know, the Bassmaster Magazine, Bassmaster Classic. I mean, back in the day, every one of those tournaments and the old school bass derbies, you literally brought every bass back and you freaking killed them. You put them on a, on a you just like you do with, you know, mahi in certain areas. You go by there and put them on a pegboard and you, it was how many bass did you kill that day? And, and Ray Scott, basically, he was one that coined the thing that uh, the term that, hey, a, a bass is too profitable to, 
to catch just once. Uh, that was his kind of saying is, hey, a bass is too profitable to catch just once. Throw it back and let's let these things repopulate and grow. And and uh, and literally now that's I mean, that's all they do. Can you imagine going to a bass tournament? And they just kill every bass. Uh, it, it seems crazy now, but for decades, that was what they did. And he really changed the mentality of bass fishermen uh, across the country. And now even has trickled into to other countries uh, just, just based on that is, Hey guys, if we continue down this path, it's not sustainable. Uh, the, so we're, we're not here advocating saying, Hey, we should never keep another fish again. Uh, I want to be clear on that. Cause I remember last time we did a podcast like this, I got some hate mail saying, Oh, I can't believe you're saying we should never keep a fish. We are just relaying the message and also relaying things that have worked in the past. And clearly people still do keep some bass. And even Ray Scott says, if, if it's like a 16 pounder, I'm keeping that sucker and I'm going to get in that thing uh, mounted. Uh, it says you still have every right to do it, but at the same point, if everyone kept their limit every single time, there's really no sustainability in that. So now we're going to break down each of these regions. So we got the panhandle first. Justin, what are they what are they proposing here in the panhandle? So we can kind of see it here. No major concerns, but trends to watch. Long term escapement trend generally declining, but above management target, fishing effort increased. Angler satisfaction mixed. Um, you know, a lot of this, it, it kind of sounds like for the panhandle area, it, it sounded like a wash, you know, 50-50. Some people are, are saying, hey, red fishing is great, still catching a bunch. And other people saying that probably with increased angler pressure post-COVID, that they may not be noticing as many as before, or it may be more difficult to catch fish. I think that's natural and probably occurs here all over the Southeast, not, not just for that region. So bag limit to still maintain at one fish per person per day. And what does escapement mean? Is that how many redfish escape from dolphin? <laughs> I, I don't know. We, we've read that. I don't know if we're entirely sure what exactly escapement means, um they, they keep using this term and it could it could mean a lot of different things um i i guess my thought would be that it's uh not necessarily recapture rate because people don't know exactly what redfish they capture again but from one fishing trip to the next are they catching more or less so i think that's kind of what it's trying to determine is the general rate of which people are saying their satisfaction of catching fish yep. or not catching as many compared to years prior and trips prior. Um, but I don't know exactly how they've determined that particular term. Yeah. I mean, I, it's, it has to be just from hearing from, you know, from the, both the recreation and the commercial or the captains that are going to these meetings and, uh, and some of the surveys that they, uh, that they are, uh, sending out but still i mean the vast majority of people don't fill out surveys and the vast majority of people don't attend you know these uh these workshops unfortunately and, and i get it i mean I've, I've been invited to everyone and it's tough right they're usually in the middle of the day on a work day right and it's just like man it's tough to, to get away so i i get it but the good news is there are a lot more recreational people attending than uh, than probably ever before just because they are realizing that, hey, if I want my voice to be heard, I got to show up to these things. And, and FWC wants you there. They, they want more data, right? They happen to be horrible marketers, in my opinion, right? That's why they don't get the word out about a lot of this stuff in time. Uh, I mean, they're scientists, right? For the, for the most part, they're biologists and they're, they're, they're not uh, promoters and, and, uh, and marketers. And uh, so they do want you to be there, just, just so you know. They, they love hearing more input and, and more data. And if you email them, which we encourage all of our members to do, and even internally, we email them a lot. Uh, they, they read those things. They actually do. They don't just go in the trash. If you send them an email on any proposed idea or things that you're seeing in your area, they, it will be read and they get to the right people, uh, just as an FYI. All right, up next, Big Bend region. So this is interesting because in terms of population throughout the entire state of Florida, there, the Big Bend region is huge, but you think about the amount of space of where water makes its way to the coast and makes contact, there's not nearly as much development in this part of Florida as there are other parts of Florida. So I'm always interested in knowing when they, when they put survey results in this pie chart, um, out of how many people is that total survey, you know, because they're the amount of people fishing Big Bend inshore or even offshore and the amount of area and water that the Big Bend has been classified as um, is, is crazy. There's not nearly as many people to occupy that amount of space as there would be 
like Tampa Bay area, you know, just north of Anclote down to what, like South Sarasota, Venice, until we get into Southwest Florida, there's significantly more people fishing that type of area than the Big Bend region where there is a ton of water to explore. So this proposal to increase the bag limit to two fish per person, uh, reduce vessel to four fish per vessel, I think makes sense. I mean, they, they wrote it here, uh, above management target, catch rates stable with increased effort, um, highest angler satisfaction, I guess, out of all the nine regions that they're looking at. So that's great. Uh, I mean, you can see the pie chart here. It seems like between good and very good or the overwhelming majority of like, what is that close to 70% right there of people that are satisfied with the red fishery in their particular area. Again, I don't know if this is a survey out of a couple hundred people or a couple thousand people, but that's positive to see. And I would, I mean, personally, I would support an increased catch rate of one more redfish um, for the area, given the amount of area that you have to explore and fish. And this is one of the few, or maybe only the areas that got an increase per person. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Cool. All right. We'll keep moving on. Tampa Bay region. Yeah. I want to hear what, what you think about this one too, because this is, this is kind of your backyard too, Joe, and you fish a lot with Luke and in, in Tampa Bay, but just kind of reviewing the spark notes here, people are acknowledging red tide is a common occurrence. Uh, 2021 bloom from last year, it was one and a half times longer than a 20 year average. So each time that it occurred, the period of time in which red tide was acknowledged, the period of time where they feel it within the centralized area that it's recorded, it's no longer uh, present or considered to be a threat or an issue, that the period of time in which red tide occurs seems to be increasing over time. And this past year, it was a long period of time and a much larger area of impact. Um, so I, I think they're going to keep they, they, they're listing maintain one fish per person, nothing changing from a regulation standpoint, but acknowledging that it sounds like from their research and from hearing from the public that red tide is the biggest concern to uh, to redfish stocks in the area. I would agree that that's, that's a big part of it, but it, it's not just red tide. A lot of that's fueled from nutrient dumping, fertilizer runoff, a lot more people moving to central West Coast, increase in population. So a lot of factors that lead to that. And red tide's the biggest kind of end result that's causing a lot of these issues. But there's a lot more to the core of this, right? You know, to, to mitigate the things that are feeding this red tide issue. Yeah. And Tampa Bay, you know, they had a massive recovery in the 70s. And, and in the 80s and got their seagrass back waters looking beautiful through the 90s and now it seems to re be reverting in a negative trend losing a ton of seagrass some of the areas that luke and i used to fish just a few years ago that had a lot of healthy grass are, are now not looking that great there's still some fish but the, it just doesn't look as good and and we never know the answer, right? Maybe the fish will adapt uh, like they have in the lagoon. There's still fish to be caught there, even though the seagrass for the most part is, is, is getting destroyed. Uh, but still, that's not something that, that, you know, we should be excited about and just, you know, say, okay, I guess it just is as it is. Um, I, it's interesting here. It says in this region, the four higher, you know, meaning the, the guides, they're less satisfied. They're the ones in the water every single day, right? With redfish fishing than the private recreational anglers who for the most part are out there maybe once or twice a month versus 20 something times per month, sometimes 30 if they're fishing every single day. And uh, so I, I, I have to look at that a little bit more seriously from the people who are literally depending on it are, are and, I, and some of these are my friends, right? Who are saying, man, it's just, it's tough. We're not seeing them like we used to and i would agree with that some of the areas that uh that not year round but areas that we always knew redfish would congregate during certain times of the year and certain tides in tampa bay are not there anymore I, I don't know if they went somewhere else or if those are just part of the the stock that got killed during the last red tide or what but it, it to me it's not where it should be and uh and that's from someone who you know essentially makes a living uh, fishing, not like a fishing charter captain, uh, but still, if, you know, our members aren't catching fish, you know, it's tough for our business, you know, just being honest. So we want as many members having as many opportunities to catch as many fish as possible. And uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm more with the guides on uh, this one. I don't think it's where it should be. And, uh, and I, I'm, 
I'm fine with it staying the same or or even being contracted a little bit in terms of what people can uh, can keep. We personally, Luke and I, don't keep redfish. We throw them all back. The only exception would be is if one completely swallowed a hook or a lure where it was so far down and there's just no way to save them, and it was obviously in the slot. Uh, that would be the the one exception, but that hasn't even happened uh, this year. So um, that's my take on the Tampa Bay. Yeah. Region. What I thought was interesting, I went I went out with Luke a couple of weeks back and we were poking around his local waters in St. Pete and areas that I thought looked amazing and would hold redfish don't. And it's one thing to hear from you and to hear from Luke and locals in Tampa Bay that say, you know, this area, it's, it's just not it's not what it was. And it's not like last year or the year before where there normally certain tides and, you know, throughout the year, you can find a couple of really nice redfish and put in some time and go out and fish one of eight different general areas in St. Pete, like his backyard and do well. And we went out, we poked around and we searched, I think we saw one redfish and it was like on the move. Yep. And I was surprised. I was like, this looks perfect. I see some mullet there. I see birds but I don't see redfish and we're at a perfect part of the tide. It just started with incoming fish should be moving closer to these, these islands that are out there. And he's like, I, I don't know what to say other than it was, wasn't like this prior to red tide and the red tide happened and now they're not here. And that's the only major or catastrophic thing that's happened in the area. So it, it, it does kind of lead you to believe that that is a, that's the big aspect of what's affecting the redfish population. Um, so I'm just saying like, it's, it's one thing to hear it, from us and then now that i've actually gone over and i fish that area where people are talking about it and i can see and, and experience like oh wow no joke like <laughs> there's no redfish here or there's significantly less like this is a problem we need to acknowledge and, and, and do something about it yeah and and this is also where it's tough having you know different regions that could be really really big st pete in Tampa, for the most part, are like touching, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're brought together all the time. They're certainly in the same region. I mean, they're right next to each other, right? They share the same bay. And St. Pete is what you're talking to. That's where Luke l lives. The areas where we used to catch redfish, they're gone. Like, we, we can't even catch them there. But yet, go just a little further south, like down to Ruskin, like E.G. Simmons and Cockroach and south of that, like Piney Point, ironically, where the you know, all the madness happened with this red tide and there's redfish everywhere. Right. And, and that's just, that's not that far away. I mean, it's a boat ride. You don't, you don't even have to trail your, if you're already on the water in St. Pete, you just shoot straight down. So that's, what's so crazy is there's been areas that have just been decimated where the local people there say, man, it's horrible. And then you go just 30 minutes South and all of a sudden there's tons of fish. So it's, it's, it's been very, very odd. Uh, and that's where it's, it's tough, you know, to make general, uh, assumptions or decisions, uh, you know, just because it, it, it varies so much, even from city to city. Um, so onward to Sarasota, speaking of going a little bit further south, this one looks like it uh, stayed the same on the bag limit, one, one red per person, but reduced it on the vessel side, huh? Yeah, and I experienced this myself when I did an insider report in an area that I have gone in the past and I've caught redfish and snook and trout at, uh, it was in Buttonwood Harbor area, and um, I had fished that that place for the past six, seven years. And even if I don't catch a redfish, I'll see a bunch in different parts of the tide. And I revisited no less than 10 or 12 little juicy points and coves and areas that I found them in the past, and I didn't see a single one. Mm -hmm. I got one snook out of that area, and there were mullet, and there were sheep's head, and there were uh, you know, there was all kinds of other life there, but not like what it was in the past. And it's, it kind of seems like redfish are this canary, you know, it's almost like if you find them, it's a sign of a good, healthy fishery. But if you don't, you got to beg the question, what's going on with redfish? Same with trout too. You know, like we, we asked that too, like where have all the trout gone? Um, but overall that they're acknowledging the same thing. Red tide is, is seriously an issue throughout Sarasota Bay. The, a big stretch of the bay gets hit by it and it lasts for a long time and it's a huge issue. Now, Tampa Bay is a bigger body of water compared to Sarasota Bay, but maybe it's how the water flows through the bay itself from north to south and coming out of the, of, of the passes. There's two or three passes in that area. Um, I've seen it in years past. I'll go with 
my dad and I and my wife, we would get a condo on the beach and we rented kayaks and came inside. I think it was Three Sisters Key and went south and we saw a giant mullet uh, just like congregated and they weren't jumping, but they were kind of spinning in a circle. And then we found a school of 40 or 50 redfish and snook just lazily kind of sitting on the flat, not moving. You could bump them in the head with a lure and they wouldn't eat it. And I was like, something's not right. And red tie was going on at the time. Cause when we got back to the beach, there were all kinds of bait fish washed up on shore. So Sarasota Bay in particular, you know, looking at the entire state of Florida is a, uh, is a hot spot area for red tide. So I can understand. Um, I mean, I, personally, I'm, I'm a little surprised they're, they're stating stakeholders desire for more conservative regulations probably because of the lack of fish that they're catching in years prior and this year in particular. Um, I guess maintaining a one fish per person makes sense. I would almost be in favor, favor me personally of a temporary closure in light of recent events. Uh, not forever, not saying that, you know, people can't keep fish forever. We're talking six months, a year or a little longer. Um, I think that it's important to acknowledge what happens in each respective area and to give it a chance to rebound. Um, there are other success stories of protecting and, and keeping certain fishes catch and release and seeing that area rebound from these type of protective efforts. So I would, I would have been in support of that, but I think at bare minimum, yes, to just maintain status of one fish per person is fine. Good stuff. We will move on down. Charlotte harvest oh, impacts a lot of people as well. Looks like they've did the same thing as Sarasota maintain one fish per person and then reduced the vessel limit to two fish per vessel. Now, the red tie conversation, I'm sure, is definitely applicable for Charlotte Harbor. But one thing to consider is that just a little further south of Charlotte Harbor, and I'd have to look back at that map to see how much of that stretch is considered the Charlotte Harbor region. You have the Caloosahatchee River to the south. And, okay, so Charlotte Harbor... And then you got Southwest Florida kind of falls into this category. We're going to get into it next, even up into Charlotte Harbor. And you've got the Mayaka that dumps out into Charlotte Harbor, a lot of freshwater runoff. You're going to have after hurricanes and storms, significant changes in salinity. Yes, that's understandable. But what additional nutrient is going to be dumped down into the harbor? Um, Charlotte Harbor to the northern tip of Pine Island Sound, Boquilia, I know you've fished that in the past couple of times, um, is not that far. And you'd be surprised at how much water covers that area and how water can move from Caloosahatchee up through Pine Island and Matlache and into Boquilia. And for sure, like Okeechobee Discharge plays a big role into that, you know, and even though that Charlotte Harbor region might not be that Southwest Florida region we're going to get into, I think that the Mayaka and the, and the Caloosahatchee and how water flows and moves South or North and meets up at that point, a lot of that's still affected um, from Lake Okeechobee discharge. So I, I, which feeds into red tide ultimately is kind of what I'm getting to, you know, all that, all that additional nutrient that's dumping out um, from, from agricultural result is, is, causing red tide blooms and issues to you know be exacerbated so uh, i can understand maintain one fish per person reduce the limit two fish per vessel um but that charlotte harbor region is kind of a unique it's a unique fishery um you have the natural runoff from the mayaka but you've got another big river source that's playing into the water quality aspect for that area as well let's this little graph here young of year indices of abundance number per sane sets this is fwc doing uh what luke and i did with them i assume where you're taking the big sane nets out and doing samples yeah. all over the area yep i i assume so it looks like they had a peak there 2002 2003 time mm -hmm. period um but and then it's kind of you know gone down and gone up and gone down but for the most part it, it seems to change every couple of years uh that's information i don't know how pertinent it is in regards to red tide occurrence um, you could have yearly class of fish. It's not like it's going to constantly be on an upward trend or high for periods of years that, that up and down that you see from about 2010 to 2020, um, could be from a lot of different factors. I don't know that it's directly a, a, a good sign to reflect what's happening in terms of water quality for Charlotte Harbor, which is the biggest reason for 
um, people's ability or inability to catch fish from one year to the next. So that's their saying that information. Personally, I don't know how relevant it is to, to that particular region as an example. Yeah, we'll keep moving then. Yeah. To the Southwest region. Aha. Uh-huh. That's your buddy, you said, huh? Pierce. Yeah, I know Pierce. <laughs> yeah, that's a really nice red, man. I don't know. I don't know exactly where that's at, but that's now I got to call him and find out. <laughs> that's pretty funny. Um, All right. So, Southwest, what's happening here? Red tide occurrence. So, stakeholders want more conservative. First thing I think of, uh, I think of red tide and think of Southwest Florida is I think of captains for clean water, too. You know, I think of, uh, fighting the good fight on behalf of all fishermen and residents through Southwest Florida. And we'll make our way over the East coast as well, uh, about Lake Okeechobee, Lake Okeechobee, water discharge, salinity differences, increase in nutrient and red tide issues, uh, lack of shellfish and supporting bait fish populations in the area to support the redfish and trout and snook we're trying to catch. Lots of problems have happened over the past, I don't know how many years it's been going on, right? Like, I mean, we started seeing a lot of this start popping up to what, 2015, 2016 kind of time period. Mm -hmm. It's probably been going on a lot earlier than that, but it takes time for us to notice um, the issues with red tide in the area. Uh, I remember a lot of the the views of people flying over and taking pictures there at Sanibel and where the water dumps out of the Sanibel Causeway. And you could see that mixture of fresh water and salt water, that brown yeah. into the green. And it's, it's just crazy because you kind of view Southwest Florida as being this pristine, white, sandy beaches, super clear water. I've experienced it walking along the beach in Sanibel, catching snook to see what's changed in the past seven or eight years is, is insane. Um, again, another area that in light of recent events and what's going on, we're, they're still proposing to maintain that one fish per person reduced to two fish per vessel. It seems like the, the tendency is to maintain the opportunity for people to harvest, wonderful, uh, but to reduce the overall vessel limit across the board as you make your way from Sarasota down you know, along the Southwest coast here. Yep. So that's the Southwest. And we're talking about uh, Cobia here in just a little bit as well. So make sure to stick around, even if we've already hit your, uh, your region. Cool little uh, way to make money for every yeah. Cobia you catch and keep. Interesting. Cool. Cool initiative. Yeah. All right. So I find it interesting that on all, all these different regions, they're using different um, uh, graphs, right? Uh, almost everyone's got something a little, well, that one didn't have one. Got something yeah, a little that bit had different. Same net catch rate. Uh, this one's got is. acres of seagrass. So it's interesting. They all have different little graphs. Yeah, right. Like it's not standardized amongst each region. And granted, some areas don't have seagrass, some areas have oysters, but yeah, it's not like the information. I don't know if it's just for that particular region. I would assume so, but you know they're not showing sane rates and whatnot for each region. Um, this is what total directed angler trips, number of trips by the thousands uh, of how many people or how many trips per angler in the year. Is that what they're trying to record? I am Ron Burgundy. <laughs> Ron Burgundy. Not entirely sure. I don't. Um, know. Southeast <laughs> region though, like, will you agree with me that? catching a redfish in Miami is finding a needle in a haystack like in, in the keys as well. Right. I, I kind of need to look at that chart, but Southeast region, you've got flamingo and the flamingo can have a great red fishery, if you will. It does have a great inshore fishery along. No. So technically they're considering the Southwest, the keys and yep. flamingo as well. And that cutoff border is right. When you get down into Miami yep. up to about, uh, maybe jupiter is kind of where that purple line cutoff looks like it's happening uh, yep. right of Joby. um so no southeast would be miami and further north and yeah I'll, I'll agree if i go down and i fish like jupiter to to miami i'm going for snook and maybe a big trout but finding redfish has been really tough um and there's there's like great grass flats throughout biscayne bay you would imagine that some of that area would hold redfish, but it's tough. People that do catch them. I have, I have a friend of mine down there. He's like, I'll be lucky if I get a 20 inch or a 21, like that's cooler of a catch than a bonefish in that area. Yeah. It's crazy. Which is why it says they have the lowest catch rates out of all the regions. Yeah. Majority of survey respondents reported fishery is good to fair. Probably in the northernmost section of that. Yeah. You know? 
you got to think like how much inshore waterway is there in Fort Lauderdale, Pompano Beach, Boynton Beach, that that chunk of the southernmost part of that region. Not there's not grass flats. It's intercoastal waterway and docks and and fancy high high rise boats. <laughs> so it's it's very very different. They should they should add on here on the regulations. If you do get two fish per vessel, then you also win an award. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> call it call FWC when that happens. Yeah. I'll give you a sticker. All right, cool. Moving on. Indian River. Now, this is the one that I think caused some confusion. Um, I guess someone had posted this in either a Facebook group or in our insider community. And some people read it as it already happened. And so people are kind of freaking out. So what do we got? Indian River. That's, I'm reading uh, all the little bullet points. Um, so uh, this is a fishery I fish a lot. We talk about it all the time in these podcasts. And you know, Luke spent some time, he lived over in what, Melbourne area and fished Indian River Lagoon, all the way up through Mosquito Lagoon and New Smyrna, Daytona. I think that's where the biggest chunk of this is. And uh, yes, it, the biggest issue is seagrass die off. You know, we are a broken record every time we talk about it, but you can't talk about it enough because it is an important issue and it's going to take a long time for, you know, for the recovery of this lagoon system. Mosquito Lagoon and Indian River is regarded as, you know, like redfish capital of the world next to Louisiana. Louisiana redfish are a special breed, but it, it was for many, many years and still continues to be an exceptional red fishery. But since I'd say 2015 is when I started noticing algae blooms, seagrass die off. I have a drone footage of pea soup green water in Mosquito Lagoon one day, and I look at it and almost cry every time I see it. And a lot has changed. A lot of anglers are reporting back because of that seagrass die off, because of water quality and water clarity issues, they are catching less redfish. Um, and this is not just from recreational anglers. This is from many guides as well. Uh, so because of that, there have been a lot of conversations, a lot of attention has been drawn to this particular region because it has gone from being this uh, glorious, wondrous place to fish to essentially a desert wasteland. I mean, that if you go and you fished it in 2011 and you fish it now, 10 plus years later, you will be, it won't seem like the same place of what it once was. So uh, I agree, this proposed regulation for catch and release only until metrics approve is, is a safe decision to ensure that 10 years from now or 20 years from now, that my friends and family, my kids someday would be able to go and enjoy uh, this fishery, you know, in, in some sense of, of the way that I had enjoyed it years prior. It may never recover to where it once was, but if we don't take action to uh, at least try to protect our fishery and provide catch and release to that particular region, we're not saying you can't go further north or further south and or even to the west coast and catch and keep a redfish. Uh, I think it is important to acknowledge for, for that particular location. Yep. And it sounds like the majority of all the people in the meetings are saying the same thing. Agreed, so. yeah. Northeast. Hmm. So I don't know a whole lot about that. Northeast region, you've got, you know, you've got a lot of current flow. You've got much dirtier water, not nearly as much seagrass. Oysters come into effect. Shell bottom comes into effect. It's a very, very different fishery. Kind of resembles similar to big bend parts and over near Pensacola, like the Panhandle area. Um, I am not sure what, what the report is. My gut would say, if you want to scroll up just a little bit, Joe, mm -hmm. uh, escapement rate increased since 2020 or 2012 fishing effort, relatively stable since two fish bag limit implemented. And that was a while back. Most survey respondents report fishery is good. Concerned stakeholders advocated for one fish bag limit. So it kind of seems like there's a mixture of people. Some people are in support of keeping things the way that they are. And other people saying that they're noticing less fish being caught. I don't know if that's a 50-50 thing, 70-30 thing, but you take it all into consideration. And FWC is just saying we're going to maintain that two fish per person and reduce the, uh, the vessel limit to four fish per vessel. Yeah. What's interesting, reading the notes, the conversations with anglers and guides were more positive than northern portion of this region than from the southern portion where anglers and guides reported no longer seeing large schools of redfish and the concerned anglers from Duval, St. John's and Flagler were the ones who wanted the one fish bag limit. So this is where it does get tough by having a bunch of different fisheries 
in uh in one zone or, or one area so, so um, it's cool richard one of our coaches now he's up in in georgia right and and the fishery right there at that saint mary's line of like nassau sound and north of that into saint mary's in that georgia area there's just as much water as a big chunk of jacksonville but the population count is is much less and the regulations in georgia are crazy you can harvest way more redfish and trout and flounder once you make your way into Georgia and you get past that northeast, you know, section of Jacksonville. So I can kind of understand further south. Um, you have less creeks and waterways once you make your way down the St. John. You have a lot of just the St. The, the, the St. John's River and then a couple of mud flats and oyster bars. I mean, I fished uh, Marine Land in an insider report that's further south of, I believe, St. Augustine area. Uh, in Ormond, or no, no, it's north of Nor uh, Ormond Beach, and it was tough. There's not nearly as much area to fish to how many people live and reside and fish within that general area. Yeah. But once you get north of Jacksonville and Nassau Sound and further north, there's a lot of area to fish and a lot of opportunities to catch redfish. So I can understand that. Yep. So here's the summary. We won't go through all of it since we already covered it, but uh, I think the nine management regions, I, I would imagine everyone's in for that. Uh, I don't, I don't see a downside. If anything, do more of them. Uh, yeah. I just, I know that, I, that also, I guess the only downside is it causes confusion, right? When you, it used to be, you could look up, Hey, what's the, what's the limit for redfish in the state of Florida? That was how it used to be back in the days. There's just one limit for the whole state. And now it's, yeah, I got a different zones and it depends on the time of year. Uh, yeah. So that's, I guess that's the only downside, but you know, there's, there's apps and, and obviously the FWC makes it pretty easy on their site to find out that information. Uh, so let's pivot real quick and talk about Cobia. So FWC, uh, I guess, tagged us on Instagram. I didn't know about this. And so we looked into it and we're like, wow, that's interesting. Get $50 reward. Uh, I don't know if it means cash or a gift card. I have no idea. It doesn't say. Uh, it just says reward. I, um, I don't I'm know. guessing it's probably a check, but um, meaning cash. Anyhow, um, $50. And you get to keep the meat, which is cool. They just want your um, uh, the carcass to be able to do some testing with. So I thought that was interesting. Um, Look at that time frame from March to September, which would be the time, the probably the, the part where a lot of these cobia are, are migrating and moving through various areas. You could find them on the grass flats of Tampa Bay. You could find them out on wrecks and reefs on the West Coast. But 2022 to 2024 that's going to go on as long as it's within that period of time of march to september yep. i don't know if they'll let slide in november december cobia because these fish the whole point of this is to get a better idea of their migratory patterns and their reproductive tendencies so what they're doing is they're collecting the carcass and then looking at the gonads of each fish to get an idea of how active or inactive that fish is at that particular location at the time that it was turned in. So it's interesting. They're trying to get a better idea of the health of that fishery of, of cobia in different regions uh, and, you know, kind of keeping this open to the angler to turn in the fish and say, hey, I caught a cobia. Let's find out what's going on with this fish. Is it is it sexually active right now? Is it reproducing? Is it Has it eaten anything? Is its stomach empty? all this information there's so much that can be found by the actual carcass so i think that's a great incentive to the angler next legal cobia i keep i'm gonna be i'm gonna be calling my buddy where i'm at the the respective fwc agent say hey what do i do where do i go with this thing yeah extra 50 dollars, dude yeah double celebration uh, they got some gonads doing this promo this is great uh, of gonads. <laughs> um real quick though i talked to someone recently who uh i won't say any more than they, they weren't aware that the rules had changed and they caught a nice cobia what used to be a nice cobia and uh they did just change it right was it june 1st or Jul yeah june 1st it changed i, th so I think so it's 33 it, like to 36 yeah yeah that's that's a that's a big difference so a lot yeah. of people were always in confusion i've been one of those guys be like is it 33 is it 34 what's the safe number so yeah, as of right now, I believe that's changed. Yeah, so it used to be 33 inches and now it's 36. So, you know, a lot of those 34s, 35s, that 
seems to be what you always catch, yeah. right? Just barely. There's a and, lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. And now it's not legal anymore. So just FYI, make sure you know the rules on that. And no, uh, you do call the number and make sure you have a legal one and, uh, and you'll get your extra 50 bucks. And they also have a reward for tagging. If you uh, can report uh, a tag, it says catch a tag, Cobia, call that number and, uh, and still release it too, which is, uh, which is cool. You don't have to, you don't have to harvest it. So Hopefully that helps. Um, we'll have more on this and just conservation stuff and in, uh, in general. And uh, we love to hear from you guys on what types of topics and thoughts and even guests to have on uh, to talk about conservation. So hopefully this was uh, helpful and made a little bit more sense of what the heck they're doing. We're still kind of confused on, I mean, I don't know why they just wouldn't use simpler terms and have, you know, uniform graphs on this stuff. But, you know, then again, I, I can't make all the, up, all the rules there, you know. You get better every time, though. Yeah, I do. Hi, buddy. Anything else? That's it. A lot of good info uh, going around. Just be proactive about knowing the regulations for your area, season yep. by season. Changes happen several times a year, and you don't want to be caught with your pants down. You want to make sure you got your license, that you, that you know the regulations before you choose to harvest whatever species it is. Um, we are responsible for doing that. And I feel like a lot of changes have been happening more and more frequently over the past five plus years. So uh, it's up to us to just be on top of that. Yep. And speaking of licenses, make sure that you have an active license. There's uh, one, someone oh, recently okay. got, actually registered for the CCA star oh. tournament, caught a tagged redfish. So everything was legal. So this has been the first one. They get to pick either a brand new $75,000 truck or $70,000 boat. And they go all the way to the final stage, like pass the lie detector test and then realize the person didn't have an active fishing license. So lost the, I mean, the cost them $75,000. And basically they had, you know, technically admitted to fishing without a license because they, they were by, it was purely by accident. Uh, but yeah, just make sure that yours is active and, and, uh, up to date. Uh, man, that's horrible. Can you imagine? It makes me really uncomfortable to think that like, <sighs> and yeah, that's rough. I just, su such a crazy opportunity slipped through your fingers because you forget to make sure that your license is active. What did Tony mention on a call? Auto renew guys go online yes. and auto renew. <laughs> like, yes. If FWC apps on your phone takes seconds to check it, like uh, be on top of it. Brutal. All right, guys, that is it for this episode. We will talk to you on the next. Thanks. Just on. Peace out. Peace.